Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here has been to tell the story, the truth of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Thank you, Karina. Um, such an important message. And, um, I, and um, Ashley um, sort of sets the stage for what we're talking about tonight um, because it's gonna be all about reciprocity and the um, their connection of of everything in our in our world, even down to the tiniest members of the um, biosphere that we're going to be looking at, and um, we're going to begin our program with a very special um, re-airing of a um, of a reflection uh, made by Mitch Jezerik from um, uh, the time of the pandemic. And as we know, the pandemic from the time of the great fish kill, because as we know, during the fish kill, um, there was an, a phytoplankton bloom of a harmful species. And we want to share with you, I want to share with you um, a reflection that he made um, just recently, looking back at how far we've come and what that meant to him personally experiencing the um, 
the plankton bloom and fish kill in August of 2020. The day before the die-off, I was at Lake Merritt just as I had been almost every day before since the pandemic began. Working from home allowed me to really observe the lake on a daily basis, which I found to be this incredible and vibrant ecosystem. At first, I was just interested in the birds, but with all things in nature, you notice the interconnected web, and being interested in the birds meant being interested in the trees, the flowers, and the seeds. It also meant becoming interested in the fish in the lake. And the more I looked, the more I saw. It got to a point, especially in the fall, that everywhere I looked, I saw cormorants, grebes, and pelicans emerging from the water with a fish in its mouth. It was amazing. Maybe not for the fish, but it was amazing for me to see. It was like having this real sense of nature, a lake connected inevitably to the ocean, right smack dab in the middle of a city, right in downtown. And the more I trained my eye, the more I saw countless fish in the lake, and even sometimes was lucky enough to spot a bat ray, a crab, or even a shark. The day before the die-off, the color of the water had already changed as it had in the weeks before, this brownish-red color from the algal bloom. But I didn't notice anything else had really changed. Until that next morning, when I saw my friend Damon Tai post on Facebook photos of piles of dead fish along the lake shore. So living just a few blocks away, I went out to see it for myself, and it was like nothing I've ever seen before. Death was everywhere. Thousands and thousands of marine life were lying motionlessly on the shore. It was like a nightmare or a horror film, but this was real. What the day before was this incredible oasis teeming with life was suddenly an endless pit of death. I took many photos and posted them on social media trying to raise awareness of what had happened, but no one photo could capture the enormity of what I saw. So I took this video strolling along the western arm of the lake just off Lakeside Avenue between Grand and Jackson Street. But really, I could have taken this around the entire lake and seen the same exact thing. Before the die-off, I could take this same path and my shadow cast into the water would cause numerous fish to scatter. Seven months later, and I've hardly seen anything move at all. Now it's starting to change. Every now and then there is a fish swimming by. Or maybe more commonly, extremely small fish, maybe even baby fish, swimming together as a school. Now if we do get a break from another catastrophic event, and regrettably it'll probably only be a break, I do believe that the lake can recover. And maybe even soon. And I'll be here for it, as it does. Thank you, Mitch. Um, that was um, a beautiful and but somber um, reflection on the the power of the interconnections of life and the the roles that plankton can play for both good and, and evil in our world. Um, so it also relates to um, one of the highlights of our month, which was our participation in the City Nature Challenge. Um, hosted by the uh, California Academy of Sciences and a bunch of nonprofits at Lake Merritt. Um, the goal of this was to document living wild species in uh, our community. And so this was a really great opportunity to check in on the lake and to see what, um, what is living there. So we're going to take a quick look. Um, we uh, looked at the water quality uh, because during the fish kill, oxygen dropped to zero. We kind of celebrated the life that we all have grown to love. Hank the pelican, learning a little bit about its migration patterns and its social feeding strategy and how actually big it is. Um, and uh, this was a collaboration of the Rotary Nature Center staff, um, the Open Museum, there's Damon Ty explaining to people how to use the iNaturalist app, which is a lot of fun. Um, the Rotary Nature Center friends were centered at the docks where we um, 
help people take a look at the fish that are down in the lake now. And yes, fish are coming back. And we uh, noticed some really interesting species that are not in our memory common at the dock. So it opens up a whole new chapter of learning about our natural world. And it's also a great way to make friends and to engage the community, including high school students here. And um, this is uh, Andy from the Lake Road Institute. Um, they're all um, learning about, and um, our high school student was teaching people about what she had actually learned uh, while doing activities at the lake with us. Um, Janai and Man, oops, Janai has had a fantastic table set up where people could come by and look at uh, a plankton toe that was collected that day. And we will be doing the same um, on July 1st when uh, we'll have another bio blitz um, looking at plankton and marine life um, called the Snapshot Cal Coast. So um, thank you everybody for um, who came out. And I think at this point, um, I would like to introduce our special guest, Janai. So there she is in the middle of the plankton. Um, Janai is a naturalist and an artist and a volunteer. Um, she's a, a trained artist and a fantastic um, uh, nature journalist. Um, she works with, um, she teaches, and um, she's a natural teacher. She can't help but uh, explain to people and, and involve them and invite them to learn about the world through art and photography and then microscopy. She's a um, volunteer with the San Francisco Microscopical Society. And um, I'm going to put in chat uh, a, uh, a link that will take you to many of her activities. It's just very difficult to keep up with Janai. On that day that um, the plankton bloom, or on one of the days when the plankton bloom was starting to um, bore in the channel of Lake Merritt in the, in the bay, Janai was actually working with uh, Rotary Nature Center friends and some high school students when she said, uh, whoops, I need to go now because I've been asked to come and do a plankton tow in the, um, out of Alameda because they're seeing this um, bloom and they want to know what it is and they need somebody who knows how to use a plankton net. And so she, um, she immediately jumped in and took some of the first pictures of the organism that was causing, uh, was spreading throughout San Francisco Bay. Um, she's also a um, volunteer with the National Marine Sanctuaries um, and has worked as a, um, on a Zoom uh, celebration of the National Marine Sanctuaries, giving talks similar to what you're seeing today um, to classrooms and groups all over the United States. So as I say, it's hard to keep up and to describe all the many wonderful things that Janai does. She um, has no fear of technology. Um, she's just um, jumping in and going to share with us um, her view of Lake Merritt and what's around us in our lake all the time and what we can learn from looking through the microscope. So thank you so much, Janai. Uh, let me just say that Janai is, um, if you have questions, please Type your questions into the chat, and um, Betsy, I mean, then and Janice and I will be looking at them, and we'll be um, asking you, ask Janai at you know opportune moments. But this is going to be a relaxed and uh, very um, chill and care and, and casual uh, thing. So please ask all questions. Uh, they're all good questions. So we we hope to you put a lot of them in chat. So um, have I covered everything? Oh, if you raise your hand, you can ask your question yourself. And that's always pretty cool. Um, so please uh, do that. And um, then I think at this point, we've dealt with the housekeeping. And we can turn the program over to our special guest, Mai Safi. All right. So my first question is for everybody else. Can you hear me OK? I'm not too loud. Because 
I just want to make sure you awesome. Great. Because the last thing I want is to be talking for 20 minutes and then hear everybody go, wait, that's too loud. Um, greetings. I um I want to thank Katie and the Rotary Nature Center friends for um inviting me to chat with you all this evening. And um this is really a very informal uh, presentation about things that I love and am very passionate about, and that's the plankton. Uh, mostly I tow for plankton near the mouth of the um, San Francisco Bay, right by the Golden Gate Bridge. There's a tide station there. And, um, and what I proposed for this evening was to start there and look at the plankton that comes in from the ocean and then move to Lake Merritt and look at the plankton that's at Lake Merritt. And when I say look at the plankton, I mean, right now on my microscope, um, we can look at the plankton that I collected today from both Lake Merritt and uh, from, from the, the tide station near, near the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, a little microscope review for people who might um, might be interested in a little bit about microscopes uh, before we dive into what we're actually seeing there, because it's it's my tool of choice. The things that we're going to look at are dust sized, and so without more magnification, uh, we won't be able to see them very well. Even though not all plankton are small, so the definition of plankton that we're going to use for this evening is that you need to be alive, you need to be in the water, and you need to be a drifter. Um, and if you meet those three criteria, you can be considered plankton. Um, not all things that are alive in the water and drifters are tiny. There are some things that are larger that also drift. Um, I, If I get tossed in the water and um, drift around, I don't actually want to be there. So I would never be considered plankton. Plankton actually complete part of their life cycle there. They want to be, they exist as drifters living in the water. So um, there we go. That's, that's the plankton piece. And then here, I'm gonna see if I can switch cameras. I've got all kinds of toys tonight. So we'll see how this works. Um, I have, I have a camera that I should be able, if there's a question, just jump in and interrupt me. There we go. This is the plankton that we're gonna be looking at, two samples. But in order to see this better, I'm gonna make it, oops, this is where I get the playing part happens. There we go. Make this bigger. Um, microscope we're going to be looking at. And the microscope has some important parts. And if I talk about them before I start, it'll make a little more sense when we're looking at things. So there's a light, a light source at the bottom. Then up from the light source, there's something called a condenser, and the condenser helps focus that light. And then up from the condenser, there's a stage. And on the stage, that's where all the good stuff happens. We put the slides that we're gonna look at on the stage. Uh, once the slides are on the stage, we can use these uh, objectives to magnify the image. So the light comes from down here at the bottom, up through, up through the slide, through the objective. And then it goes up into the head of the microscope. And I have um, my fancy microscope here. I have oculars. So this is the part that I would look through um, when I'm looking at the plankton, but there's also a camera and that's how I'm able to get the image out to everybody else. So um, with that explained a little bit, then the, the tide station, let's see if I can share this with the group, the tide station. Will it let me, Katie, will it let me share my um, share screen? Oh, it will. Hold on. Here we go. This is going to be exciting. Maybe. <laughs> maybe it will, maybe it won't. So are you having trouble sharing? I was going to try and share. 
Ah, there we go. I found it. Never mind. Um, it's all good. Share screen. So this is this is the website for the tide station where I collected the plankton near the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, I collected today. And if I scroll down here, you can see the tide station has the water level. The red line is what the water level actually was. The blue line in the graph is what it was predicted to be. So today the water was a little bit higher than it was predicted. Um, other information that's available at the tide station, this is a publicly available tide station. The information there is available to everybody. Um, it has wind information, air temperature information, water temperature information. Um, and it's located right near, right near the Golden Gate Bridge by Chrissy Field. And so this is where I was able to do my first collection stop. That's what the little building looks like. There's a classroom on the end there. And then this here is the actual tide station itself, that tiny little speck. Now, the plankton we're gonna see is behind me. So hopefully you can all see it. And we're looking at it in dark field. So I'm going to take myself and shrink my view down so that so that I take up less space here on the screen. And I prepared a slide. So we already have a slide up that is the San Francisco Bay Plankton. And this was collected um, at one o'clock today. So the tide was fairly high. And we have lots of phytoplankton on this slide. When I collect the plankton, I use a net. And the net that I use has very tiny holes. The, the, the smaller the holes, the smaller the things you can catch. Now, a lot like uh, if you're straining things in the kitchen, if you have a strainer with really big holes, it's great for berries maybe, but if you're trying to rinse rice because you're gonna be cooking the rice, it's not gonna work as well. The rice will probably fall through. Um, and, and end up in the sink. And so when you're collecting plankton, you wanna think about the size of the organism that you're interested in collecting. And these are all dust-sized, dust-sized organisms. Any questions? That was a lot of stuff really quickly. No? No questions yet? I'm gonna have to ask you all questions then. I have a so question tonight. You do? Go ahead. Well, about the slide we're looking at. There seems to be uh, just a few variations. How many organisms might there be in something in this frame? All right. Thank you for the question. So mostly what we're looking at here are diatoms. One of the things people often ask, because I'm going to get to that, is uh, are we seeing bacteria? So there are bacteria here, but they're too small. They're smaller than dust size. And so we're not seeing them. So I can't even count them in the, the count of the things that we're looking at. But uh, I do have my handy dandy little arrow here and I can start pointing out some of the different types of plankton. Most of these that are golden brown and beautiful here, they're just gorgeous, um, are phytoplankton. And almost all of the phytoplankton that we're seeing, all these golden brown organisms are diatoms and they come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. So I like to start with centric diatoms, like the big round ones, because it's a great way to point out some of the features. And then we can look at the variations because there's there are a lot of different ones here. And Almost all of these show up at Lake Merritt in one way or another. Uh, a lot of them will come in through the water, through the channel. Ah, let's see. I think that'll be. Mm, I'm looking for one in particular. See that golden circle there in the middle? Yeah. And that one there. We're going to try and zoom in on that. I'm gonna try and not fight with my microscope too much for that one. 
and I can use my camera, maybe, and make it do a little bit of the work. So we can get really close and personal with this one particular organism. So here we are. This golden brown disc is a diatom. It's just one. It's a centric diatom. So it's, it's a, it means it has a circular shape. It's centric. If you cut it up, you could cut it up like a pie or a pizza into wedges. Um, it has that radial symmetry. So it's, it's no matter which way you slice it, the slices will all come out the same. Um, when I focus up and down, you can see here, I'm just gently rolling the focus of my microscope up and down. We're actually looking at, at really thin cross sections through this living cell. So I'm gonna come all the way to the top and you can see there's this really delicate pattern in it. Um, these little tiny dots, those little dots that we're seeing here are openings in the cell wall that's made of silica, hydrated silica, they call it biogenic opal. So it's, a, it's a, an incredibly uh, fine, delicate pattern that, um, that we're looking at. And it allows what's inside the cell to communicate and do all of the biological things it needs to do with what's on the outside of the cell. Lori, not Lori, uh, I, yeah. they, Lori wants to know how much are these being magnified? Aha. Uh -huh. So I can zoom back out and I have a scale bar. Um, if I were looking, if you were looking at this with me through the microscope, right now on the microscope, I'm going to zoom back out. It's a fun thing to do. So I zoom all the way out. The objective I'm using, right, on the microscope that I was just showing you is the 20 times objective. And the way you tell how, um, how much magnification you're using when you're looking through the microscope Right, it would be the, the objective power. So it's 20 times the ocular power on mine, which is 10. So 20 times 10 would be a 200 time magnification if I were just looking with my eyes through the microscope. But then it gets a little bit squirrely because I add a digital camera and then there's whatever Zoom does. And then there's whatever size screen you're watching it on. I mean, maybe you have like a home theater and it's like, you know, five feet across or 10 feet across, or maybe you're watching on your phone and it's a five inch screen. So, um, so the, the relative size is really hard, but I have, hopefully this works. Let's see if this works. My fancy dancy camera here has a scale bar. And if I can choose the right level of magnification, I should be able to pop up a scale bar and it's going to be in micrometers. So it's slightly less than hundred micrometers. So this distance here, um, all right, Katie, my science teacher, math helper, <laughs> there are 10 of these in a millimeter. Micro micrometer. Yeah. 10 to the micros minus three thousand per meter right and so it's a thousand per per um, millimeter no uh, micrometers okay uh this uh, is where so somebody with google this is a trivia question that we've added we oh yeah somebody help us out so okay folks it's a uh, 0 0.1 micron is the bar that's so one tenth of a milliliter uh, sorry a hundred microns a hundred micrometers is, is, is one tenth of a millimeter, mm. which is uh, one ten thousandth of a meter. One Thank ten you. thousandth of a meter. Yeah. So Thank micron you. is actually ten to the to the minus six meters. Right. 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 One micron. Yes. So Thank there, you. there would be ten of these lines in in, in a millimeter. There would be ten of these lines in a millimeter. Yes. There we go. So that's how tiny this is a very dust sized particle. So to give you an idea, you can imagine 10 of these lines lined up and that would be a millimeter. Mm -hmm. 
I know it's kind of a long way around, but um, but I want to make sure we got that answer. Oops, let's see. I can see if I can get rid of it now that I popped it up. Oh, you you could leave it there. I can uh, leave it then... there, but I'm going to change magnification. So that's gonna that's part of the part of the fun here. I see. Uh, okay. I can zoom in and out. Um, so that it won't actually stay in relation to the zoom that I'm using. So we're going to go back in and look back at this, um, at the cell wall here. Right. So each of the diatoms that we're going to look at today, as we look at ones from by the, the Golden Gate Bridge, all the way to the ones that we look at at Lake Merritt, have the same structures, but they're arranged differently. So um, let's see here. So these tiny little pores, these tiny little openings are called areoli. And then just behind them, inside the cell, these little golden lumps that you see, sometimes I can focus on them a little bit better. Those are the chloroplasts or the plastics. Those are the parts of the cell that do the hard work of making the food from the sunlight. Um, and then on some of these cells, there are special features that extend outward, out from the side of the cell. And they'll either be made of this hydrated silica or they'll be made of other materials that the cell oozes out through those little openings. But this is a very, uh, it's a classic shape and it's easy to see some of those structures that may be harder to identify in some of the other diatoms we're gonna look at. I'm gonna zoom back out. And now we're just gonna explore, and I'm gonna answer that question, David, about um, how many different things are we actually looking at here? So right here in this particular view, this one here, oops, let me grab my arrow again. This particular one, the centric diatom is most likely a cosmodiscus. These ones here that are in a row that look like little beads, they're also centric diatoms, but we're seeing them on their side. They're flipped on their side like a, a stack of Oreo cookies in a package. When you <laughs> rip the package open, you see them side on and you can see the filling. So that's how we're looking. That's the orientation of these particular diatoms. If I pulled them apart, pulled one of the beads off this thread and we flipped it on its side, it would also be round like this. Um, when you're learning about diatoms, another one of the things you need to learn about is the way things look when they're oriented on a slide isn't always, um, it's not always obvious what the three-dimensional shape is. Um, there's a chain here of diatoms. These ones here are most likely skeletonema, which we have a lot of at Lake Merritt. The ones at Lake Merritt are, um, are longer and more slender. So we'll see some more of those. There's a curly, let's see, I'm gonna drive around a little bit. We have, um, we have another chain here. This is another chain of that Galassium, Galassia Syrah here. This long chain that looks like a chain of beads. And then there's another chain here. This one looks like it has horns. And those are extensions of the cell wall. And the, that one's called Catoceros. And there are a large number of there's a lot of variety in Catoceros in that genus. And so we'll see some that are in Lake Merritt too, um, but they do have these great extensions that are made of silica. There's more here, another type of Catoceros there. All right, two more and one more. Can you speak to why they're so chain-like? Ah, so some of them chain together and some of them float independently and they're different they're different strategies or niches. They have different adaptations in the environment. Um, well, that's a neat one. Let's pull that one over. So some of them, some of them have make these really long chains. Now, one reason for that adapt adaptation can be 
that um, it helps them avoid being eaten. The longer your chain is, the harder it is to get into the mouth of a predator. If you're just one little single centric diatom on its own drifting around, you're a, potentially a nicer snack um, for an organism as it drifts by. Um, this one here might be, um, it's a different one. It's possibly Dactyliosolin or Lunardia, but it's another type of chain of diatoms. It's also centric. If we took this whole chain and we flipped it and looked down the end, we would see that it would be also round. Some of the diatoms that don't chain together um, have really interesting shapes too, besides the circle. Let's see, that's another interesting catastrophe there. Right here. Shapes. All right. And this is another example of the types of shapes and sizes that these diatoms will come in. This one here, this is actually, there's like a little tiny chain of beads and it's very thick. I'm actually focusing up and down through this mass of cells. Each one of these little beads or bead-like structures is an individual cell. And each one of them is a type of catoceris and it's called catoceris socialis. And it makes this lovely kind of brain shaped curved structure. And it has these same spines as this one does, only they're, they're short on the outside and then long on the inside. And it helps them curl together and stay linked in this, this kind of ball shaped structure. So mm -hmm. Hillary is asking, um, what are the long feelers part of the same cell? So yeah. what are they? Yeah, so these, these, these extensions of the cells like here, you can see there's one coming off. This is one particular cell and it has one extension coming off of it. Um, the, they function in a number of different ways. One, um, one reason that is um, hypothesized for their, their extensions is that it actually increases their surface area so that it slows their sinking um, and it helps them stay in what's called a photic zone. So when you're an organism that photosynthesizes and you can't swim, you can um, adjust your, your density. So you can like store up oils that you've, um, that you've made uh, just by photosynthesizing. It's part of your, your cellular functions. You can store them up inside your cell and that can help you stay afloat, but you can also increase your surface area. And so some of them will have these, these long thin extensions on the cell. This particular clump here with these extensions is called Asteria nelopsis. And it's a fun one because at Lake Merritt, there's Asteria nella, which is similar, but, but different. Um, I'm gonna do, well, pick one more. So there's just so many right now here on this particular slide. I can't get past the, there we go. Can't get past all of the amazing Oh, here we go. Oh, don't tell her. There's a little tiny one. This is one of the ones that doesn't chain together. Right here. And, but it also has some of those extensions on it. Now there's another fun thing about these cells that chain together. When they chain like this, they haven't found each other out in the ocean. They weren't drifting alone and went, oh, hey, you're another Catoceros, let's, let's hook up and, and drift together in a chain. They're actually clones. And so all of these cells in this particular line are all genetically identical. They're all clones of each other, just the same way as this group of cells that are all linked up in a chain are clones. What happens is as they divide, they actually will stay linked together as clones. Janai? Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Did you happen to mention that because there are other organisms that do 
float around and find themselves in the ocean and link together. And you wanted us to be sure not to confuse the two. Well, I usually, so the, I, I know there are zooplankton that will seek each other out in the ocean and link up. Um, as far as phytoplankton go, um, unless they're, uh, unless they're reproducing sexually, they're going to be, when they're in chains like this, it's because they're clones. Well, the thing is that, um, if you, if I may, my computer kept me from uh, joining at the beginning of the session. And you may have uh, covered, you just mentioned zooplankton. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to this, you've been talking about phytoplankton. And I did have a question. I don't know if you went over the difference between phytoplankton and zooplankton before I arrived. Ah, we did not. So okay, we started yeah. out. I'll have to hold that question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's actually, it's actually a great time because we've, we've been poking around this slide and this is a slide chock full of um, phytoplankton. And I'm going to see my other camera real quick so that you can see. There we go. These are the two plankton samples that we're looking at right now. This one here, this darker one. And this is from uh, near the Golden Gate Bridge. And one of the things I like to do is I like to use a flashlight. Oops, let's see if I can get it just right. And sometimes you can see the zooplankton swimming towards the light. And if I can see them swimming towards the light, then I can actually get a sample. There, I can see them kind of swimming. Do you see them coming across that little yeah. thing? Beam? Yes. Yeah, so nice. those are the zooplankton. The zooplankton are the animal plankton um, and they're, they're phototoxic. So they are attracted to the light, these particular mm -hmm. ones because they were at the surface when I was collecting. So I was going to try and take a sample of these ones before we move on too far. We'll see. And then we can try putting them on a slide here and see what we've got, if it worked. Sometimes I have to do it a couple of times. So the, the fun thing is a lot of people watch videos on uh, Instagram and YouTube, and they've got these great videos where people show all these really amazing organisms. And you get like 30 seconds of really spectacular stuff. And um, surprisingly, it can take an hour <laughs> to get just the right view of that really spectacular stuff um, up on a, on a camera under a microscope so that you can see it. Here we go. So I'm gonna zoom out one now. We'll get even further away and then close this. There. And we'll see if we have any of those little organisms swimming around. Here we go. Let's see if I can get into focus. We have a lot of space on this particular slide. Those are copepods zipping around. And there's a little one. I'll try and flatten them down with a slide cover. Give them a little less space to zoom so that we can see them a little more clearly. So the zooplankton are really fun because there are some zooplankton that are plankton their whole life. They're always gonna be drifters. They're drifters when they're born, they're drifters as they get older, they're drifters until the moment of their death. And they are plankton the whole time, so they're hollow plankton. And one of the trivia questions today was, what's the word for something that's plankton for only part of its life? I guess I and for something that's only plankton for part of its life, um, it is going to be, there's that catasterous we were looking at. That little, oh, and there's a couple pod next to it. So you can see how big that clump is next to something that might want to eat it. If they were just those individual little tiny cells and not linked together, they would be much more easily, um, they would become food for a different. Tonight. 
Did I see Daphnia moving around? So uh, Daphnia in particular are freshwater. Okay. Um, but we do have something that's very similar to Daphnia. Okay. And um, they're uh, called Podon. The one that we're seeing here, that one that's really bright, if it slows down long enough for me to get it into focus. Um, let's see. Is a baby barnacle. That's a copepod. Okay. There it goes. And the one that keeps flying past is a little barnacle. That's a bubble. Uh -huh. With the school groups, they're like, oh, I found this thing. It's really cool. It's a circle. Yes, it is really cool. It's a bubble. It's a really cool bubble, but it's still a bubble. Uh, so say the name of the one that's jerking, moving around all over the place. That's a baby barnacle. So okay. the 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 nice thing about let's see as soon as I can get it to slow down mess with the lighting a little bit so that baby barnacle there in the middle if it slows down long enough we'll get it into focus so it looks really pretty um, there are barnacles all over Lake Merritt uh, barnacles are um, are sedentary they 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 stay put once they are adults. But when they're when they're young, they move around. That was a copepod. A copepod is kind of like a tiny little shrimp. It's the best way to describe it. If you watch SpongeBob, plankton on SpongeBob is actually uh, modeled after a copepod. Let's see if I can find anyone else that's being cooperative. So, Janai, we had a question about um, the there's so much movement in this picture. Oh yes, and and then um, when you were talking earlier, it seemed like there was less movement when we we're looking at the um, big screen. Is that were you? Was that a matter of of the magnification, or did you have a background? Ah, so uh, when I sample from the jar that I'm using, there's a couple of different ways I can do it. Let's see if I can. I just want to find something to look at while I while I work on that answer. So there's a, a couple of different ways to sample. Um, you can stir up the jar that you're using to look in and have everything suspended, both the zooplankton and the phytoplankton, right? The animal-like ones and the plant-like ones. And, um, and then just get a um, uniform sampling of what's, what's there. However, Another way to do it is to try and be selective about what you're what you're collecting. Oh, that copepod pot looks really good. Um, and and by using the light, uh, the way I was showing you how you could just see the organisms coming towards the light. That's one way to selectively. Um, sample what goes onto your um, onto your slide. Another way is to let the um, the phytoplankton settle out to the bottom of the jar. So all of those diatoms, since there's no wave action, there's no current in my jar, they kind of settle down to the bottom. And then I can pull just from that that bottom part of the jar and get a really rich uh, sample view of what the um, of what the, the phytoplankton profile is. And there's a little baby copepod. So unlike a barnacle, this one is gonna be plankton its whole life. Um, there's just such variety uh, in, in plankton. We're gonna switch over to the Lake Merritt plankton now because I wanna get there. But What's so much, um, what's so fun is it's all connected. The Lake Merritt plankton is connected to the bay because the Lake Merritt water is connected to the bay. So when the tide goes up and down at Lake Merritt, plankton and water are getting pulled in and out all the time. And let's see, you should be able to watch me do this. So we've been looking at this particular sample. We're gonna switch over now. And we're gonna look at, at this sample here. This is the Lake Merritt sample. I'm gonna prepare a slide real quick. Any questions while I'm 
putting a slide together. How about this? Does the chat have, does anybody have a, a request about what kind of slide I pull next? So I can pull from the bottom of the jar. I can try and get some zooplankton or I could just stir it up and we can get a random sampling. What would you like? Um, it looks like Janice is saying mix it up. Mix it up. All right, Janice, <laughs> we're going to mix it up. All right, so here we are. So there's a little bit of light. Um, and I'm going to give it a stir. This is a separate pipette. Um, so we're going to stir this sample up nicely. And then take a, let it settle for just a moment. And then I'm going to pull from the middle, not just the top or bottom. And so here in this pipette is what we're going to be looking at. So put that onto a slide. And we're only going to do, we'll do two drops so that it's a nice one, maybe three. There we go. Plankton so buffet. Huh? I was someone said plankton buffet. <laughs> it is. It yeah. is. Well, so that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting thing because, oops, sorry, my light is flashing. There we go. Um, one of the things that happens um, for animals like, like the barnacle that we were looking at, they will drift in the plankton and that's basically like drifting in your food when they're babies and here we are so i'm going to we're going to zoom in one on this. i'm going to turn off there we go and one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to switch to a slightly different view too. We're going to explore a little bit with this. So a lot of the phytoplankton at Lake Merritt is a little bit smaller, more delicate. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's actually quite a bit here, um, but they're really tiny and thin. So let's see. I'm going to move this out of the way, maybe. There we go. So we have, we have chains of diatoms, these really delicate little chains here. Um, and we're gonna zoom in on some of those because they're spectacular when you look a little bit closer. And I'm gonna play with the magnification. So we're gonna go up in magnification, first here in dark field. These are skeleton Nema. And there's some catosaurus too. But I want to go, we're going we're gonna to make it bright. So if you have the lights down in your room, this is a warning. We're going to go a little bit closer and a little bit brighter. Um, it's going to take a minute for me to adjust. So Janai, um, uh -huh. how, how typical of late merit is this? And you know, we've been looking um, you know, over a long period of time, um, is it changing a lot or how typical is this, what we're seeing today? Uh, so the plankton at Lake Merritt is seasonal and it's really, um, really fascinating because it, it changes. Um, so it's going to take me a moment because I want to get this. Just I guess I wanted to ask is it how, how different is it from what you see at the Golden Gate in terms of the kinds of um, phytoplanktons that you see? So right near the mouth of the of, of the bay, we get a lot of um, we get a lot of plankton that is um, let me just adjust this. We get a lot of plankton that comes in from the ocean. So we get ocean plankton. Sorry for all the colors we're rotating through here. Um, right. There we go. We'll get there in a moment. Um, <laughs> nearly, nearly, there we are. So, um, I'm 
trying to get a closer view at some of these, but it takes a moment. Hillary thought she saw a little fish in there. I thought oh, I in the jar? I thought it, it wasn't a fish. It was a piece of a uh, piece oh. of algae that was spinning around. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I check. So one of the things I have a permit for collecting plankton. You need a permit with Fish and Wildlife to collect plankton if you're collecting it. Um, and I only keep things that are smaller than half a centimeter. And if I have fish in my sample jar, I will often take a picture of them with my cell phone, and then I return them to the water because uh, I can't keep them alive. And I don't have a, um, I can't really see them on the microscope because they're too big. So this particular, um, this particular diatom, this is a catasaurus. Let me see if I can get it into focus a little bit better. This is like one of the ones that we saw, but it's, it's smaller. It's more delicate. Um, it has, let's see my, my camera. My camera and my microscope are fighting today. Uh, and it's like a little bit of a light show. It's kind of like a disco. There we go. And hopefully it'll stay there. Almost. There's a sweet spot I'm trying to tune for there. So we can see as much detail as possible without getting the color as an artifact. So the, the, the diatoms that I see at Lake Merritt are almost always the same types of diatoms that I'm seeing near the Golden Gate Bridge, but they have in my, like the few times, and I say few times, because I've only been looking for like the last year, Katie, with you, but, um, but they, they seem to be more delicate, uh, less, um, a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit less, uh, they're not as brassy as the ones that are, are, are drifting in from the, from the bridge, but this is one of the ones like what we had. It's catastrophic and it has those same long, thin extensions on the cell. And these are, these are a chain of clones. You can see the chloroplast inside. That's a really delicate chain of diatoms. And here's another one. Let's get this one focused. It's another type of catasaurus here. But they're they're definitely smaller. And um, let's see. Smaller than what? Smaller than the ones we were just looking at. When we were just looking at those diatoms, those are ones from near the near the mouth of um, of the bay right by the ocean yes and so the ones in lake Merritt um are are definitely in a a, a different group and they're they're and, different size group i'm wondering if um photosynthesis is their primary thing for diatoms it is definitely their pri that's what they do right and so i'm wondering uh other than the bl blockage of sunlight, what other challenges do they face? Being eaten. Mm. And then having enough nutrients uh, to be able to, to, um, to, to be able to multiply. So the limiting factors for diatoms are often silica, which is, um, which is what it uses to make its, um, it's hard parts. This here is a little chain diatom. It's called skeleton lemma. It's actually one of my favorites. Um, let's see here. You can zoom in on it. And we're going to go to the focus. There we go. It's a very delicate, beautiful diatom. It has it has little tiny linking bits of silica that extend like fingers from one side, from one cell, one of these clones to another. And those little linking bits, like right here, you can see where they're actually holding on to each other. 
they'll stay linked together even after they die. So when they die and there's nothing left in the cell, the cell will often break apart here and, and the empty contents will spill out. <coughs> but these links will stay together. They're holding on so tightly together. Are the three cells we're looking at there fairly identical? They are clones. And if this one's a little bit bigger than these ones, most likely, and by bigger, I mean in link. This one is getting ready to divide. These two here have more recently divided. All right. Let me see what else we can find here. I don't like my printing. We'll explore. Oop. What do we have here? So sometimes I find things I'm not exactly sure what it is. So this could be could be a diatom or an egg. It's probably an egg. Um, let's see. It's a detritus. We're going to do another slide from the bottom of the jar. See if we can get some really goopy stuff. You know so I when you stir it up, even though I've concentrated the sample. Oh, Katie. What? It's another catastrophe. I thought it was polycrichus. We were zooming around. Oh, I was like, no. Oh, it looks like polycrichus. Yeah, so, so, wow. Those, those polycrichos move really fast. Um, but that was a good, uh, for me, it was a good example of how where you sample is important because they seem to be at the top in my sample. And then, when you pull from your jar? Yeah. 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 That's where I found a lot of them. But um, you know, things change really fast in a plankton sample. Sometimes. They do. Here's the centric diet. That's beautiful. Well, Janai, while you're setting up a new slide, can we take a pause to take a look at the ending our uh, credits? And then if you have time, would you be willing to stay a little longer to show I us can... a little more of the late merit sample? Yeah, sorry. I get um I get caught up in the plankton. Cool. So please. Well, we were all caught up in and in, in hunting for these things and learning about them. Um, but I'd like to take just a few minutes here, a couple minutes really, to share my screen. So um we are coming up upon eight o'clock, which is our uh, formal ending time for Lakeside Chat. And thank you so much, Janai, for um, uh, agreeing to stay a little bit longer and share more. Um, we want to thank everyone for coming and hope to see you um, when we have our next chat in June. Special thanks to Janai, uh, to iNaturalists for all of the great um, observations during the City Nature Challenge, to the Lake Merritt Institute, Adopt a Spot, our high school achieve volunteers, Lake Merritt Voting Center, and so many more members of the community of Oakland who are uh, good stewards of our lake and trying to learn more about it. So coming up on May 20th, um, it's our third Saturday cleanup day, and we'll be focusing on our um, marsh area but, um, just off of the parking lot. A great place to see organisms uh, from birds to um, microbes. And so we'll be there from 10 to 12 on the 20th. Um, if um, we also uh, want to thank the um, KTOP TV, the City of Oakland's TV's channel, for rebroadcasting our programs. And um, I think I need to backtrack one for a moment. Yes. Uh, so on the 20th of May, we have our cleanup. On June 2nd, we're going to have our next uh, Lakeside Chat. Um, we're in conversation with two speakers, and both of them are awesome. We're going to have one go early and one go late. So we'll inform you via Eventbrite uh, who's on for June 2nd. On July 1st, we're going to have another uh, table out by the um, parking lot to sample the aquatic life in Lake Merritt for Snapshot Cal Coast another California Academy of Sciences program. And um, again, using iNaturalist. 
So um, we participated in that you know, snapshot for three or four years. And so again, this is a great opportunity to see how um, the ecology of the lake is changing. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our programs are rebroadcast by KTOP TV and we thank them for making them available to people 6 to 7 p.m. on Sundays. Um, the first two Sundays of a month are a collection of, from our archive, and the last two will be a collection from the current month. Um, the show that you've been watching just now will be um, uh, turned into a YouTube video um, after some expert editing by uh, Rob Ramon, and we'll be able to share it with you by email um, probably by the end of the week. Um, we'd also like to thank some of our other um, uh, supporters, the Frederick E. Hart Foundation for Educational Opportunity, um, the Elks of San Francisco, major supporters of our programs. We want to thank all of our participants, um, volunteers, um, who have come out to um, engage with um, exploring and learning about Lake Merritt. If you enjoy what we do, um, we have a donation button on our website, and uh, we've been able to branch out to give small stipend to students who come out to help on uh, our days out by the lake um, with our tabling. And we've been able to provide small uh, amounts of funds for transportation locally to students, to classes that can come to Lake Merritt to uh, have in-person activities. Here's what our website looks like, and that should go into chat shortly. Um, and you'll get it also in your um, post-chat email. So again, we want to thank our producer, Rob Lamone, um, and the Elks. Um, David Wofford and I are co-chairs of Rotary Nature Center Friends. Um, we have wonderful staff um, that are growing in numbers. Um, Kirsten Furman is our art and design person. Um, Dr. Janice Lynn Walker is, um, comes out to the lake all the time to help, Betsy Schultz, Patty Donald, and many other volunteers. We are Rotary Nature Center friends, an all-volunteer nonprofit advocating for the Rotary Nature Center in Lake Merritt, Lakeside Park, as an interpretive education and science center for all the people of Oakland, and as the steward for the Lake Merritt Wildlife Refuge, the first in the nation. So thank you so much for coming. And um, we are going to um, close now our formal hour, but um, Janai has graciously uh, agreed to stay and talk more about Lake Merritt Plankton. So um, thank you for those to those who need to leave at this point. We'll be sending you the recording soon. And thank you. Um, for those who want to stay and talk. Um, please put questions into chat and raise your hand so we can ask, you can um, turn over the mic to you and you can ask your question of tonight. Okay. We're ready. Is Lake Merritt Plankton? More, more like Merritt Plankton. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of skeleton in that. Mm -hmm. Well, Janai, I wanted to ask a question. And um, well, let's see. Um, it may have a couple of uh, parts to it. Uh, it sounds like in reading the chat that there's a general sense of uh, phytoplankton versus zooplankton, and phytoplankton being more plant like, mm -hmm. as I understand it, and zooplankton being animal like. Mm -hmm. So, um, those two distinctions amongst um, uh, the groups. Uh, so we were talking about dial tones, and we were looking at the slide. You kept using the term phytoplankton, which would be the one that's animal-like as opposed to zooplankton. I'm sorry, the one that's plant-like as opposed to zooplankton that's an animal-like. And so when you were talking about the animal-like phytoplankton, no, the diatoms, 
you kept referring to them as phytoplankton. So all, all, my question is, are all diatoms phytoplankton and none of them zooplankton? All diatoms are phytoplankton. But, you know, as soon as you say something as a scientist, right, as soon as you make a, a statement, a blanket statement about things, right, if I said all diatoms photosynthesize, guess what? It's not true. There are some diatoms that are so wild, they'll live on other organisms and they've stopped photosynthesizing. And um, I know a gentleman in Florida who studies those types of diatoms that live on things like manatees and, um, and sea turtles. Uh, there are some that live on whales, like on, um, on orca or on the baleen of certain whales. So there's some diatoms that, that will use the, the nutrients around them when they're living on a surface of an organism, but there's not a lot of them. They're really, really special and they're rare. They're like hard to find. People look for them because they're, they're such a, a, a special kind of exception to what, what's the typical rule. <clears throat> Well, the ones that exist, in a sense, are descendants of ones that used to photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Apparently, they lose the ability to photosynthesize um, over, and um, it's it's not it's not a, a not a rare occurrence. Apparently, they there are a number of them that have lost the ability over time. Um, and I don't know then if they, they gain the ability. It's it's a it's like oh, it's above my pay grade. I don't I don't. Um, it's not something that I see. I don't see those types of diatoms, but I do know that that they exist, and people study them. Okay. So Miriam has a question. Um, Miriam, would you like to ask? Um, would you like yeah. to ask it? Um, I, I can, un you can unmute yourself and let's see, would you like to ask it or? Um, yes. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. We can yes. Definitely hear you. I, yes. Uh, when you showed the copepods and the baby barnacles moving around, I was wondering what are their means of motility? Do they have flagella? Do, do they use some kind of air, you know, uh, system? Uh, and maybe you can discuss, uh, to talk about what are their means of motility for the zooplankton generally? Yeah, so zooplankton can move around in a lot of different ways. And when you're this small, the water is more like um, like swimming through honey. So, so for the these tiny little organisms, the 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 surface tension on the water is very different than we experience it when we get wet. Right? It's like it's smooth, it's slippery, and it it kind of like we can brush it off easily. Um, but for them, they can actually push through it and against it. Um, and there are researchers who are interested in making tiny machines move. And so they've studied the way different types of plankton move. So there's some that'll use uh, rings of cilia that will, um, that will wave. And it looks like they're spinning in a circle, it looks like the cilia, those little wiggling hairs on them are spinning in a circle. But really what they're doing is they're moving. If you've um, ever been to a concert or a sporting event and people, people do the wave, they like stand up and sit down and sequence going around the stadium. So it, that's the, the sequential movement of those little wiggling cilia, those little wiggling hairs on some zooplankton make it look like they're spinning like they're rotating those hairs, but they're not, they're just waving them in a, in a pattern. Um, so they can move with cilia, um, they can move with flagella, they have a, a wiggling flagella it can help them move through the water. Um, some uh, zooplankton have jointed legs, segmented legs, they're arthropods like crab and shrimp, they have jointed segmented legs that they can use to move and push and swim um, in the water. Um, let's see, there are some with whip-like tails uh, that aren't flagella, that are actual tails, something that's called um, 
there's a, a Oikoplura. It, it's a, it's um, also larva, um, larva like the babies of things like sea squirts. And um, I'm trying to focus in on this other word more. Mm-hmm. Um, that can use like a tail and be propelled through the water like a tadpole would. Uh, So there's a lot of different ways of moving through the water. There are some diatoms that move, um, that'll tootle around, um, and they'll move on something called a raphe. This raphid structure is part of the the silica, and there's a very thin, um, very thin groove in in their cell wall. And it's not actually been studied extensively, but one theory is that they actually like have this kind of like um, little tractor tread of mucousy material that they uh, run along that tread to help pull them forwards and backwards through the water or through the, uh, along a surface. But there's a lot of different ways to move in the plankton. So, uh, Janai, uh-huh. I wanted to ask um, the same question that I asked earlier about the diatoms okay. and their relationship to phytoplankton. I wanted to apply to the copepods as one question. And then I'll, I'll pose a second one, and that way you can take it uh, as you may. And that is uh, the luminescence, some of the, the, sl- of the slides you show, there's a lot of luminescence in them. And uh, how is the luminescence generated? And what, if you will, accounts for the variation? Because some, when I'm looking at it, sometimes there appears to be quite a bit of variation uh, of luminescence. So uh, one, of the, one of the things about um, so the, the, the brightness, the luminescence uh, that you see on the screen, right, has more to do with my microscope um, and the, the light that I'm playing with through the microscope. Let's see if I can focus on something that you can hear. So the, the, there are a number of different types of microscopes and they have different ways of um, of showing you what you want to see. Um, and so I'm using a light microscope and the light comes up through the slide. And depending on how I use lenses and, um, and filters and patch stops, I can block light, I can focus light, I can diffuse light, I can um, break up light in such a way that it shows me more of an edge, uh, depending on how I adjust the microscope. And um, that's why for right now, for example, this is in dark field. So I have something that's blocking, that's blocking light that comes up from the bottom so that it doesn't come up directly from behind. And it's giving this this kind of side lighting to the diatom. So if you've ever seen like a supermodel photo shoot, you know, on some show and they have like people with these great big, you know, reflectors bouncing sunlight or, or light back at the model so that it's a nice even light that lights them. It's kind of what I'm doing with the microscope when I'm in dark field. It's like bouncing this light all around shining back at the at the diatom that we're looking at right now. So the light, the, 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 the microscope does a lot of that, but there are organisms that are bioluminescent. The thing is, because my microscope uses light and my camera needs light, I can't see the bioluminescence, right? If they glow on my microscope, because it would need to be completely dark And then I would have to have a camera that could pick up the tiniest, tiniest fluctuation in light. And and I don't have that fancy equipment. You would actually need to like have a a very sensitive sensor on your camera to be able to capture that. And and I don't. Then in that case, uh, how 
how do we account for the um, the coloration and discoloration that occurs in Lake Merritt, random? So in, in Lake Merritt, so the colors that you see, right, individually, like this one, it's golden brown. Most of the, the diatoms and the dinoflagellates tend to be golden brown. Um, that's what their pigments are. That's what, what the, the photosynthesis. And so when, the, when there's a lot of them in the water, um, it, it's the wavelength of light that is bounced back at our eyes, right? Then the one that's not being absorbed that's coming back at us is what we see as the color. And, um, and when there's a lot of them in a group, then we can register that color more, um, more easily. And uh, the whole physics of light thing, I don't even uh, pretend to begin to understand. It's, uh, it's amazing and complex. And we could find an article on it for anyone who's interested in diving deeper into oh, the yes, physics thank of you. light. Yes. It's really cool. I mean, it really is. Any other questions? Because I just, I like some really pretty diatoms here. I want to see if there's any zooplankton. There's a lot of little flagellates. Look at that. These little tiny ones that are zipping they move around. fast, yeah. Yeah, they're moving too fast and they're a little too small. Mm -hmm. I would have to let them sit a little bit and slow down. Should I even think about making anything out of the fact that um, when I look at this, it looks very similar to like images I see from um, outer space? Yeah, looking out and looking is in. That just, is that just random coincidence or something? <laughs> I don't think it's random. I think there's something about how, um, I mean, how I'm manipulating the light right now, it does look like space having it be in dark field. And then I can switch to phase contrast, let's see. Mm -hmm. Bright field. This will be a little bit, sometimes it makes it a little more like space, depending, let's see. Less dark, but more more sparkly. Is that a dividing cell possibly? Or? It is, That's mm -hmm. so that long skinny one there? Yeah. That's datillum, and it's it's working on dividing. It's actually a really old cell. Let's see if I can. You were telling me at one time of something really interesting about size and age. Um, yeah. In, so the, in diatoms. Yeah. yeah, diatoms because they've got that hard cell wall. They um, when they divide, they actually have to grow a new half of themselves to be able to divide into two, like a, um, imagine like a Petri dish, right? They don't stretch necessarily. So they have to grow a new, a new bit inside the existing, um, inside the existing cell. And then eventually it um, gets big enough and it'll separate and either they'll stay chained together or they'll like drift completely apart. And um, every time that happens, they get a little bit tinier and a little bit tinier and a little bit tinier until they get so small they can't do what they need to do to be a cell anymore. And then they have to reproduce sexually. And that's a whole other lecture, talk, yeah. discussion. It's, that's blowing my mind. But, uh, and that, the next question that I was gonna ask is related because it was, do the phytoplankton have individual cells similar to mine they go through the processes of like mitosis and meiosis in terms of duplication uh, so that's the whole other talk yeah i see <laughs> so so yeah, right now my question was so okay next time next time so uh uh this particular cell where the arrow's pointing it is um, the cellular material is separating. It's going to be dividing into two cells. It's a very old detillum because it's really narrow. It's really squashed down. This particular kind of diatom is, um, 
is this particular one in this genus of diatoms is getting near its like narrowest phase. And so it's nearing that point, David, where it would want to reproduce sexually. It's been doing the, the division that's cloning and it gets smaller every time it clones itself. It's a little bit tiny, a little bit tiny, a little bit tinier. And then it gets to a point which it's close to now where it's gonna say, okay, it can't clone anymore. I need to do, I need to go through sexual reproduction so that I can, um, I can reset my size. And so what it does is after, after it, um, after the sexual reproduction, it has a face, it's an oxospore and it's, it's the biggest, it like blows up into this huge giant version of itself as big as it can possibly get. And then inside that oxospore, it makes a brand new um, silica cell structure. And then that becomes the initial cell. And that's the biggest it's ever going to be. And then it starts dividing and dividing and dividing and like cloning itself after that, cloning and cloning and cloning and cloning until it gets so small, it has to start all over again. Um, do and do you happen to know if there's a... Um a term for that process, a name for that process? Yes, there is, and I could look it up. If I have my book handy, which I don't. Either way, I, and I will try as well, thanks. Yeah, so it's um, because it, 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 it's the, the reproductive cycle of the diatom, and, um, and it has the two phases, one where it reproduces asexually by cloning, and then where it reproduces sexually through the sexual reproduction phase. But I know there's another word for it and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Mm. That was a pretty detail. <laughs> yeah. There's just there's just so much in the plankton. Um, right now there's a lot of the skeletonema these long skinny chains. They're really beautiful. So when I was talking about how there's different sizes, different uh, diameters of them. So there's this one here that's kind of wider. This one here that's a little bit bigger. This is also skeletonema, but see how much thinner it is than this one? They're different ages. This one here is divided more times along its it's cloning, cloning line than this one. So kind of interesting thing to see like them right next to each other, how much cell division has been happening in the lake. Miss Janai, can you tell me what, what's their uh, basic nutrient? For phytoplankton, the basic nutrient. What do they need? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's a limiting, there's, there are limiting nutrients in any system, but they're, they're like plants, right? So they need, so, so many of the nutrients that we have that run off um, are nutrients that, that they use and, mm -hmm. uh, be able to create their cell structures. And have they been around sort of, uh, what do they call that? Like since like Cambrian times or pre-Cambrian times, that sort of thing? Yeah, there's an interesting article actually on um, on how, how far back um, they go. Some of the earliest diatoms are um, are some of the fossils that people have looked at. There's someone who is looking at them and trying to find the source material to be able to learn more about them. And it's their conclusion that they weren't actually diatoms that were recorded, that they were, that they were observed in the fossil record. And so, um, so there's some debate about the oldest diatoms and, um, and when and how they were observed. Uh, but there were definitely diatoms in the times of the dinosaurs. So uh, 
Jurassic, probably just before the Jurassic, what is that, Cretaceous? Triassic. Triassic. <laughs> Cretaceous. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, that's amazing. So, oh, look at that. I know. I'm like, what is what that, huh, Katie? That? Is that Spirodira? Mm. Oh, my it goodness. Looks, well, I'd like. No, it's not. No. What is that? Is that like an. That's just an artifact that from the thing? light. Is that a fiber? <laughs> no, no, that's no, a spiral. That's a. Fight a plane. Okay, we're going to play. Let's wow. play. <laughs> Look, this is playtime so, now. Uh huh. Yeah. Amazing. It's uh Did you put your arrow on it? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me put the arrow here and then I'm gonna play with the focus so that we can actually see what we're looking at here. Let me put this filter back in. And oh, yeah. oh, you know what it is? It's a cyanobacteria. Look at that. Oh yeah. Look at that cyanobacteria. That is so cool. Wow. And it's actually, it's corkscrewing. Look, look, you mm -hmm. can see the end here as it um, twirls down. That's cool. That's and how do you identify it as bacteria? Ah, cyanobacteria. So it's not a diatom because it doesn't have those beautiful silica cell walls here. Look. And it, the way it's moving is not a diatom thing. Let's let's go closer. Let's zoom in, and then I can work on tweaking it and see if we can see. So cyanobacteria have um, really thin cell walls, and um, also also they have. Let's see. There's just. Mm. There's some skinny little diatoms next to them. Oh, yeah. So you, can't, you can't even make out the cell walls. And it's actually going to corkscrew right out of you. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So, like, how does it move? How does it move? How does bacteria move, Katie? Well, they generally have um, like things like flagella and stuff like that, don't they? Yeah, they're, well, that's they're, funny. It seemed to me like it wasn't even moving until you asked that question. Oops. <laughs> but now I can yeah. see it moving. At first, I couldn't see it moving at all. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Spyro gyro. What is, what's happening at the top? It looks like each head disappears. <laughs> And one head falls into the other and it disappears. It's like a corkscrew. It's corkscrewing. Oh. Wow. What a phenomenal, what an amazing thing to show up in the last right at the end. five minutes. Yes. So we're now um, at the end of our, our usual um, time to, to say goodbye. And Janai, this has just been mesmerizing thank you so much really enjoyed it and uh, we will be um, putting together a uh, email with some more links and things that Janai has shared um, and so that we'll get that to you uh, probably by the end of the week and then the the whole program will be available on um, YouTube uh, when Rob has done the editing and I'd like to encourage people to come out um, to Lake Merritt when we're out there because every time it's different and um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff there to see at the microscopic level. Yeah. So we have an identification from Jim Irvin. Ah, <laughs> okay. What does Jim say? Jim. Oh, it's a filament, a planktonic filamentous cyanobacterium called Arthrospira platensis. Oh, thank you, Jim. That is very cool. How does it move? Yeah, Jim. How does it move? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know my. You don't, yeah, I don't oh, know either. That's a good question for deeper research. And anyway, thank you, Janai, and thank you everybody for coming um, and staying. And just we could go on forever. These are such fascinating organisms. 
Well, Janai, I want to say that um, I feel like we just touched the tip of your genius. And uh, we didn't have enough time to really dig deeper and explore. So perhaps uh, someday in the future, you can return and uh, we can go even deeper. I am happy to talk about so LinkedIn all the yeah. time. Very cool. And um, I think, Janai, are you going to be out um, on the 2nd of July, possibly, at the lake? Maybe? Not on the 2nd. Oh, no. Okay. Well, have a different time. A different time. Yes. We'll let people know. Uh, yeah. So, oh, uh, and Anthony made an important point that phytoplankton suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's part of the biological pump, pumping carbon dioxide into the ocean and kind of helping us, you know, reduce the uh, carbon dioxide in our ass atmosphere so really good point um anthony awesome there's so much there's so much to like like there's a carbon cycle plankton are involved in actually forming clouds because of stuff mm -hmm. they give up i mean there's just you can't yes spend They're, a lifetime actually control their environment the weather you know immediately around them they're crazy yeah so, there's a lot there's a lot yeah again I, thank you so much everybody i think we're going to um have to call it quits. Is there one last question? We have some one more thing. One more thing. I think Anthony, it says phytoplankton set carbon, an important role in carbon sequestration. They're also obviously the bottom of the food chain and I mean the whole aquatic, you know, pyramid of life. And also some a lot of the life on land really depends on that. Uh, thank, thank you, Anthony, if you're still there. I hear you. So about the carbon pump, they yeah. suck carbon out of the atmosphere. But then when those zooplankton migrate up and down in the oceans all over the world every day, they come up to the surface, they eat what the phytoplankton have pulled out of the air, and then they go down lower in the ocean and they poop it out. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because they're pulling the carbon pulling the carbon out of the air, becoming food, and then getting pulled down deeper and then released it's just it, there's so many no, no, i'm sorry who is it that does that so the phytoplankton get the carbon out of the air yes and the zooplankton eat them at the surface in the photic zone and then and then during the day those those zooplankton that were eating them at night during the day they swim down to hide in the darkness deeper in the ocean and when they're down there they poop and they get rid of that carbon that they ate at the surface. And then they're hungry again. And then when the day is over yeah. and the night comes, they swim back to this. And there's just so much, there's so much. You can so just- much. Can, We were learning about- amazing. The, um, the um, their, their behavior is uh, remarkably similar to mine. Ah. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? You go out and eat at night. Hmm. Well, the pooping part, maybe. Oh, well. <laughs> so also, they, their shells, those shells you were telling about, contain carbon. And they're uh, dense. And if they don't get dissolved <laughs> before they go down to the bottom, um, they can keep carbon out of the atmosphere for quite a while, too. So they're really important climate regulators. Anyway, this was just wonderful. We have all so much knowledge. And Janai, you are a continuous source of of inspiration and knowledge. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was really great.